kind of graphs we're going to go over. Who's ever seen a pie graph? Do you know what I'm talking about? The circle that's divided up in slices? Oh, I've never seen that in my life. Never in your life? Okay, a Venn diagram. Does anyone know what that's talking about? Or maybe you remember the word, but you're not sure. It's where you have the overlapping circles. So it kind of shows different things and where they intersect. Stem and leaf plots. This is where you have like a base number, and then you'll have a line, and then you'll have a bunch of things listed. We'll talk about what those all mean. Scatter plots. That's what it looks like somebody sneezed on a graph, and you have a bunch of dots all over the place. And then box and whisker is actually a new one that's not been around for a very long time. And that, all it shows you is your median range, upper quartile, and lower quartile. If you have box and whisker, there's no way for you to figure out the other information because that's all it gives you. So we'll show you how to pull that information off of it. The good news is you don't have to create any of these graphs. You just have to be able to read them, which is the less time consuming part than actually creating them. Let's start with the pie graph. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and make one and then analyze it. What percentage of your day do you guys think you spend sleeping? A little less than 50%. So we'll say, oh, that's not even close. Does that look like a little circle? Okay. We'll say 45% of your day. So what percent of your time do you think you spend watching TV? 100, the rest of it? Well, let's have a few oh, more. Um, let's say 10% uh, watching TV. I thought you were watching TV. That's okay. Now, I know this won't be accurate. We're just going to make one and then look at it. What other things do you guys do? School. Good. What percentage do you guys think you spend of your day doing school? All day. Let's say 25%. Let's say you're feeling lazy this day. Okay. So how many percent do I have left? How can I figure that out? Yeah, let's add them. So 25 and 45 is 70, right? And 70, 80. So we've got 20% left for Eating? Alright, we got our important stuff up there. <clears throat> so the type of question that might be asked on the KMA is what do, is your median thing that you are doing during the day? How would we figure out the median? Oh, median. Yeah, the median. Yeah. So if I wrote these, I'd have 10%, 20%, 25%. So we're talking, sorry. Not for the median. For the median, you're just looking for the middle thing. Oh, you're right. I need to add another one. Thank you, Dominic. Let's divide this into two. Let's say 10% eating and 10%. Say it again? Texting. Okay. That sounds good. Because you're right, otherwise we won't have a medium, would we? So what activity represents our median? Oh no, those are all 10%. Hold on, quick. Okay. This is what happens when you try to do things on the fly. So what activity represents our median? Now that I've changed everything. 15. 15, so what activity would that be? Watching TV. So that's the kind of um, question they might ask on the KMA. So besides me changing all the numbers, does that make sense how you would go about doing those? Now you don't have to make the graph. They'll give you the graph. You just have to analyze it. What would be our mode? What thing do we do the most? Because um, if they asked, depending on how they asked us, if they asked what we did the most, what would you say? Sleeping. If that's what percent was the mode, that would be 10%, which would be the eating and texting. So make sure you're reading how they're asking the question, because unfortunately, sometimes they do try to be sneaky. So questions on pie graphs. It's really just pulling the percents 
out. They don't ask the mean usually, it's usually the median is what they're going to ask you about. Every once in a while they'll throw in one like, what are you doing the most? That kind of a thing. Okay, the next type of graph we're going to look at are Venn diagrams. So if you look at this, how many people would be wearing sandals? Close. That's actually what most students want to do first. The thing they forget is actually everybody inside this circle is wearing sandals, including the one, three, and the two. However, the one is wearing sandals and jeans, so that's why it's in here. The three are wearing sandals, jeans, and t-shirts. And the two are wearing sandals and t-shirts. But if they were to ask you how many people are wearing sandals, you'd have to include everybody who's in the sandal circle, which would be 15. So we've got 15 people wearing sandals. How many people are wearing t-shirts? We've got 20 people are wearing t-shirts, because we need another color up. We look at the entire t-shirt circle. We've got to add the 10, 5, 3, and 2. And how about jeans? How many people are wearing jeans? 24. How many was it? I'm sorry. 24. Did you guys see how to interpret a Venn diagram? Because on the next one, I'm going to ask you to tell me what type of clothing is, do people wear the most of. So we're going to do a different one. We'll get the same. So I want you guys not to shout it out, but on your paper, write down what article of clothing would be the mode, would represent the mode. Meaning, in this case, the way the KMA asks it, what type of clothing are the most people wearing? And this one on the left over here. Isn't that the right part? Oh my goodness, yes. On the right. I'm going to have to edit that out of the video so that's not documented. All in time. So don't say that loud. Because some people might still be trying to add up the numbers and stuff like that. To figure out what would be the mode for the article of clothing. Questions on how to read Venn diagrams? Is this too easy for you all? You're going to get through the assignment in like two minutes. Alright. Jen and Leaf Fox. Would you say we can just talk to one thing? Did you guys get all your assignments done? Oh, I can talk? I don't think you guys want to. 
This is what a basic seven leaf plot looks like. Something like this. And this might represent the age of people in a room. So we'll say this is the age of people in a room. And seven leaf always has to have a key in order for it to be accurate, where they would do something like this. So you know that one line six would represent 16. So the easiest thing for me to do when I'm looking at a seven leaf is to put the numbers back together. So for instance, zero five, that would mean the person is five years old. So like my lowest number would be five. And then all of these, would be teens. So like there'd be a 16, there's three 17s, there's an 18, and that would be if you wanted to put those back together, what you would write. So I have a 5, a 16, three 17, and an 18. What would I do for my next line if I was putting them back together? Does everyone understand what the seven leaf looks like? Okay, so if I asked you what the median was of this one, what would that be? Okay, so 18 would be a median. Now, on the KMA, in addition to simple seven leaf, they have what's called a double seven leaf, and I want to show you that so it doesn't freak you out if you see it. Is anyone still copying this down? Because I don't want to. And this is what it would look like. <coughs> so notice how there's leaves coming off of both ends. <laughs> so this might be over here in their ages, and this might be group B. And then once again, we have to have our E that tells us that that's like 14. Because in science, sometimes they'll have this, and maybe it represents 1.4 instead of 14, so that's why they have to have the key. Or it could represent 140 if they're talking about something that's bigger like that. Now, the way the KMA might ask you a question like this is how much bigger is the median from group B than the median from group A. So if you guys think on your paper, you can figure that out. If you want to do one together and then give me a and give you another one. Well, can you have some help for yours, Jason? Like a hint. A hint? I just, I don't know if you want to say that loud enough. question. Yes, go ahead. Does it go like 45, 35, 25? 51, oh, great question. Actually, you read this one backwards. So this is actually 52, 53, 54. And, then and then 51, 51 and 57 for the other group. So 40, so you, that's, I'm glad you asked that. So these are the first numbers for both like of the us. Main number. Yeah, those stay the same. And then you're reading this one like that and this one that way. So I didn't make it up, I'm sorry. Wait till we get to the box and whisker. I don't know who made that up. But anyways, mm -hmm. some of these things we just have to accept that somebody thought it was a good idea. So, to me this was just kind of confusing to look at. But So yeah, this one you would read that way. This one you read that way. So, if it were me, what I would do is list group A and list them out from small to biggest. And then list group B, list them from small to biggest. So why don't we start with that. So on your paper, oh I'm sorry, what, how much bigger is the median from group B? than the median from group A. And I'm really hoping group B's median is bigger because I just made this up on the spot. So it's possible it's not. So you already got it done? So would that just be two? Uh, 
Um, for this one, actually, there's no 20s here, so you wouldn't have anything. That was your question. Or did it just be two? No, actually, there wouldn't be anything there. Does that make sense? It's like there's nobody in their 20s in this group. Kind of like there's nobody in their 30s. All the way in this group. Yeah, if this was a zero, it would be 20. But if that was a zero, that would be two. Exactly. If it was like this, yes, that would be a two. But I'm going to erase that. If you have this done on your paper, if you have your answer on the paper. Yeah, put your answer on your paper and then you can go. How much bigger is the median from group B than the median from group A? You don't have to add them, you just have to figure out the middle one from each side and then figure out how much bigger. So if you're working on it, just ignore what I'm doing right now. And just keep doing what you're doing. Okay, those of you that are home, let's check your answer just quick. So for group A, you have 14, 15, 31, 42, 46, 51, 57. Is it live? No, it's recorded. That way you can edit it just in case. And then group B, is 16, 29, there's no 30s, 41, 47, 47, 52, 53, 54. Is that, is that all you guys got? Yeah. Okay, so then the median is 47 on that one. Thankfully they're the same, so don't worry about adding them up. So when you're saying you don't have to add them? Well, you can. Yeah. 47 plus 47 and divide by 2 at the back with 47. Does that make sense? 47 plus 47 would be 94. Then 94 divided by 2 is 47 again. Because <laughs> um, remember, if you have 2 in the middle, you add them and divide by 2? Yeah, that's what I do. Did you, and you didn't get 47? No, I didn't get 45. Did you just do 47? Uh, Okay, so how much bigger is the median from group B than group A? Five. So that would be the answer if that was the question on the KMA. Five. Five. Yes, you may. Thank you for waiting. So questions on the stem and leaf. I think the most confusing part is when they have the double stem and leaf and you have to read the one side backwards. And they do have one of those on the practice ones online, so I'm assuming they're probably going to have one of those on the real test. Maybe they won't, but, but, but now you're ready. Flip. It is a smiley face. Is it bad? Questions on stem and leaf? No? All right. Let's go on to the next one then. Oh, actually. Oh, I thought I had an example. I have an example of scatter plots. So scatter plots are really what the name says. It's a bunch of plots or dots that are scattered across the graph. So it'll look something like this, only it's not nicer. And kind of like we did with the bar graphs, it's just a matter of pulling the data off of the graph and then analyzing it. So I have an example from the website for us to try. 
Unless, are there any questions just about what a scatter plot is before we go to an example? Okay. I'm not sure if that's too small, but I'll kind of help you read it. There's also this random line that I couldn't get rid of, and I'm not sure why it's there. So it says that the scatter plots below show the number of hours 15 people spent playing two video games and the number of points each person earned playing each video game. Which statement about the mode and the range of the number of points earned in each video game is true? <laughs> so I'm going to circle the number of points earned because that means we're looking at the values this way instead of the values this way. Does that make sense? So we don't actually care how many hours they played. What we care about is how many points there are. So how can I figure out the range on video game one? What would I do? You could. Or you could just find the top one. Exactly. What I, would, what I would do on this one is I would just figure out the top one. So it looks like a thousand is the top value of points. And what's the smallest value? 100. So what would the range be on the first one? Does everyone see where the range would be? 900? 1,000 minus 100? So for the first one, my range is 900. Okay. On your paper, I want you to write what the range of the second one is. And just give me a little bit of a nod. I feel like I can tell. Them. The range is your biggest value minus your lowest value. And remember, on this one, we're just looking at the number of points. Oh, yeah. number, so it's good. Except for, I didn't do very good instruction, so I had a few students that were, that were confused, and now we're all good. So what's the range? 800, right? So we have 1,000 for our top one, 200 for our bottom one, so our range is 800. So now I want you to figure out what would be the mode of the number of points for each of those video games. And once you have it, I want you to check with your partner at your table and see if you have the same one. Yeah, so find the mode of video game one, then find the mode of video game two. I want everybody to 
have to by themselves, so they're not just like, well, I'll wait until the day I want to do it, and I'll just come to the end. Sorry, Donna, what was your question? No, actually, I was giving you guys all time to think about it, because sometimes students will just be like, well, if I wait long enough, somebody else will say the answer. Oh, I don't know. We'll have to look into it. Okay, so, first of all, what did you guys get for the mode? I have two right now. Uh, is this another error one? So the mode for graph one, it would be, it looks like 700 because there's three at 700. And the mode for graph two would be 500 because there's four at 500. Okay, so A says game one and game two have the same mode. That should be and range. Well, that's not true. They don't have the same on M1. So B says game one has a higher mood range. No, so B is not actually correct. Really? Good thing I can edit that. Come on, talk later. Okay, C says game one has a lower mode and a higher range than game two. Would that be true? Is game one's mode lower than game two's mode? No, so that one's actually not either. Sorry. So then D says game one has a higher mode and a higher range than game two. So notice how the range is higher and the mode is higher. So that's why the correct answer would be D. Does that make sense? Sorry. Thank you guys for answering this. Okay, we have one more type of graph to get to, and that's called box and whisker. I didn't say they were stupid. Now, box and whisker, they call it that because it's actually a box and it has two whiskers. Kind of like a kitty. That's what I think of every time I hear box. Okay. And this is what it's going to look like. You're going to have a box that's got a line somewhere in the middle. And then you'll have a line with a dot coming off each side. And each of these things represents something. This one is the lowest number in your data. I don't know, but it's new. Like, they didn't have that when I was in school. I remember they doing test it, but it so. It's, it's like, there's not a, you could do a different way to, I I agree. <laughs> I, like I, this is, I'm showing it to you guys, so when it comes on the test, you've seen it already, and you're like, oh, no problem. And this is the highest. I think it's now for Really? Maybe. I know that in the younger grades they show you. So that's the two whiskers. Represent your highest number and your lowest number. In your box, that is the lower quartile. Remember we talked about that last week? Is one side of your box. What do you guys think the other side of your box is? Upper quartile. And the middle line that's in the box is your median. Now, thankfully, we don't have to make these, so we don't have to worry about calculating it. We just have to look at the graph and pull the information off in order to answer the question. Quartile? Um, if you take your data and you put it from smallest to biggest, if you cut it in half, that's your median. And then if you look at what's left underneath that median, if you cut that part in half again, that's your lower quartile. So it's kind of like the first fourth. And then the upper quartile is the same thing, only you go to the top part. So you have your median, you have your highest, then you cut that in half. That's your lower and upper. Good question. All right, so you guys ready to answer some questions about it? Okay, let me erase this so it's not over the top. I didn't say you said anything else. Okay. Now this one might be kind of hard because it's a little bit small. Thankfully when you have the paper and on the test it'll be bigger. So it's saying a veterinarian weighs animals before they are examined. The box and whisker plots below are based on the weights of 14 dogs of the veterinarian examined on two different days. Which statements about the weights of the dogs is true? So what I want you to do on your paper, if you can read the graphs okay, is write down the lowest number for the first dogs, the lower quartile, the median, the upper quartile, and the highest number. Those four, I'm sorry, those five data points. 
And then do the same thing for day two. If you're not able to see, I'm actually totally fine with you coming up here with your paper, getting closer, looking at it. You don't have to stay in your seat. After you write down those five, scan the answers and tell me if there's a term on here that I have not yet talked to you about that perhaps I need to address. You're looking for Julie? She's right back. term up there that's in one of the choices that I haven't talked about yet? Yeah, no. No? No, wait. Yeah. Yeah. Interquartile range. What is that? This is your upper quartile minus your lower quartile. Uh, so, this is upper quartile minus lower quartile. So it's like the range, only instead of doing the biggest versus the smallest, you're doing upper quartile versus lower quartile, which is why it's called the interquartile range. Does anyone need more time finding those five data points from each one? So let's look at A. Is the median weight of the dogs the same on day one and day two? No, because day one the median is 50, and day two it's somewhere between 50 and 60. So A is not correct. Is the range of weights of the dogs less on day one than on day two? Let's see, day one, we have 90 minus 10, so this range is 80. What would the range on day two be? Yeah, like, I'm gonna guess this is 15, so 75. So is the range on day one less than the range on day two? No, nope, so B is not correct. Okay, let's see. C, the lower quartile value of the weights of the dogs looks the same on day one and day two. Is that true? Yeah, it looks like they're both 20. Mm -hmm. So this one would be correct. And the second one, it looks like actually the upper and the lower are both the same. Mm -hmm. So the interquartile ranges would actually be the same, which would make B false. So they're not going to be different. Questions on that one? Okay. Questions overall? You guys ready for the assignment? Okay, you have about 25 minutes. I'm going to stop the video quickly.